What's up, everybody? Welcome back. We have another episode of Roundtable. This time, maybe we'll call it Box Table because Josh and I are sitting on our own boxes and there's no Roundtable anymore, darn. Different room table. <laughs> Different room table. Our branding is not consistent with this series so far. <laughs> we'll work on it. We'll work on it. Uh, we are discussing Game Night's Caldheim, which came out uh, probably a couple of weeks ago now at yep. this point. Uh, a really awesome game. We were joined by some amazing guests. And as always, we're going to break down the game, talk about the most discussed moments. But because Rachel and uh, Jacob aren't here, they're going to be sending in video clips that we'll be cutting to throughout. Right. So Jacob, the guy that plays Hawk on Cobra Kai, <laughs> um, and Rachel Weeks are both going to be sort of cutting in from time to time. We'll play some clips uh, where they answer the most asked questions, most discussed moments right along with us, but they're not uh, in the room with us. So remember the goals of these roundtable shows are to sort of address all the stuff that is the most commented on, mm -hmm. the the stuff that has the most questions uh, during the game. So we always gotta say it, if you didn't, <laughs> if, if, if it's a spoiler show. Yeah. So we are discussing the entirety of the Game Night's Called Time episode. So spoiler alert. Put that all over the screen, editors. Wee, wee, yeah. wee, we, wee. We, we can't do this without ruining uh, what happens. So if you have not seen the Game Night's Called Time episode, hit pause, go watch it, come back, because we are going to totally ruin what happens. Yeah. Um, and also, you know, if you want your comment to be shown on air, we draw from them usually within a day after the video goes live. So make sure that you're watching and commenting in those first 24 hours for the best chance, because we like to pop them up on screen as well. Yeah, we like to show all the comments about stuff, so you might get to see your comment on screen during the episode. All right. One other thing uh, we always like to say as a disclaimer, we're not calling anyone stupid or dumb for the questions that they have. Um, the fact that a lot of people ask certain questions means that we didn't properly um, explain things during the episode. So that is our fault. Mm -hmm. uh, and also there are some, there are always a few things in the episode people notice that are mistakes that we legitimately made. We are humans playing a game of magic and we don't always get it right. So without further ado, let's get into the round table. The first couple of questions were for Jacob specifically. A lot of people were pretty excited you know, that a member... I was excited. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, exactly. That a member of, you know, a popular TV show um, plays magic, loves magic, is a fan of Game Nights. Plays Commander. Yeah. Loves Commander. I mean, very well educated about magic, totally knew the rules, mm -hmm. like knew yeah. exactly what he was doing. So, it wasn't like somebody who just dabbles. This is somebody who plays a lot. Uh, so, there were some specific questions people had for Jacob we wanted to start off with. The first one was... How long has Jacob been playing Magic? I have been playing Magic for three years now. I started uh, my senior year of high school. My math teacher, Mr. Oberbeck, taught me how to play, and now I beat him all the time. So shout out to you, Mr. Oberbeck. Wow, nice. That's uh, that's three out of the, what, six years we've had this podcast now? Yeah. So, so that's a good amount impressive. of time. Good job to Jacob's math teacher. Yeah. You know, we always talk about how math is such an easy and way, like easy way to learn math is by playing magic. So it makes sense as math teacher. Talking if about I was a math teacher, I would want to teach my students magic because it's a way to trick them into learning a lot of important <laughs> math things, right? For sure. Yeah. So another question a lot of people had for Jacob and I also had this question, so I'm glad everyone asked, mm -hmm. which is, he mentions at the end of the uh, Game Nights episode that his playgroup is mostly cast members from Cobra Kai. Ooh. And people were very curious what other cast members, what other actors that are on the show play magic with Jacob. So, well, Jacob, we'll let him answer. The cast members that play magic are Joe, who plays Kyler, Sholo, who plays Miguel, and Gianni, who uh, plays Dimitri. The four of us play quite a bit. We mostly do um, Commander, uh, but every once in a while we'll do some Standard or Draft. We like drafting a lot. That's always fun. That's really cool. You know, when I was doing Mulan, everyone was like, does any of your castmates play Magic? I'm like, no, not really. But Jacob, ha what, like, it seems like multiple people, a full play group within the cast plays. Yeah, a lot of the sort of main Cobra Kai people. <laughs> I mean, I guess he, him and Jolo are the main two right. Cobra Kais, so that's pretty sweet. That is really cool, by the way, because, like, maybe they can feel like they're fighting off screen, you know, maybe right. they add to their chemistry on screen too. Yeah, and well, it's funny too because uh, the the guy that plays Dimitri and Jacob, their characters in the show kind of used to be the nerdy type, and then right. Jacob's character kind of split off and became Cobra Kai. But it's funny that they 
off off camera they have this sort of quote unquote <laughs> nerdy hobby that they still do right yeah it's like very in character for what their characters were i would love to see a picture of them on set all in the makeup right because because jacob the has mohawk. the mohawk yeah and we didn't obviously he doesn't have that in real life there is so. one picture on twitter with them playing and i, I gotta say they're, oh, playing, that's with, right. that's they're right. playing with no sleeves on we'll put that picture on mm, screen interesting in the cobra kai way i suppose yep <laughs> so jacob wasn't the only one that people had questions for and actually so for rachel something kind of exciting happens and it happened in between when we shot game nights and mm-hmm. when it released so rachel was um inducted into selected to the well, i don't know what to call it uh, <laughs> you've gone through it right <laughs> yeah i still don't know what to call it she was selected to join the commander advisory group which is called the cag um and again this was announced in between the filming and the release so it wasn't actually addressed in the episode because mm. at the time of filming we didn't know it was going to happen um so I guess we didn't get a chance to have her address that on game night. So we thought we'd give her a chance now to kind of tell everybody what that means. Um, and especially if you don't understand what the keg is, mm-hmm. she's going to kind of explain that as well. So we'll let Rachel talk about it here. The commander advisory group is a consulting body for the commander rules committee. Um, while they make all of the final decisions uh, when it comes to rules changes, uh, we get the opportunity to provide them with our experiences and our opinions and observations before they decide. Um, so it's very exciting. It was it was such an honor to be invited to participate. Commander is one of my favorite things in general and obviously my favorite format. So um, the opportunity to help shape it is is very powerful and um, I'm, I'm thrilled to be asked. It was very sweet. Very nice. You know, I think Rachel has proven very clearly, just even in her Game Nights appearances and when we talk to her about Magic and Commander, she really understands the format. You know, if you follow on Twitter, she's always posting really interesting combos or things that she's thinking about brewing. So really engaged in the community as well as engaged in the game. And that's the perfect person I think you want to have on an advisory group. Yeah, I totally agree. She's great. Uh, as a great addition to the CAG and somebody who obviously like thinks deeply about magic mm-hmm. has a really good perspective and not, and somebody who's going to take it seriously. Right. Yeah. That's, that's definitely very important. Okay. So let's get into this game nights episode specifically and the questions everybody had. Uh, the first big question is why each player chose the commander that mm-hmm. they chose. So for Jacob, you know, we asked him, was there some reason you gravitated towards Coma or was it literally just it's a serpent and Cobra Kai for life? Uh, I chose Coma because I, I really like token decks. That's my favorite commander deck I have is a, a Slimefoot the Stowaway deck. It's a Sapperling uh, commander deck. And I originally just chose it because it could pump out a bunch of uh, tokens every turn, like the Dragon Broodmother card. Um, and I didn't I didn't realize how uh, oppressive and board state control it would be. Um, but I don't know. That's, I, I originally wanted it to be a, uh, polymorph, uh, deck. So use the tokens and polymorph them into really big creatures. So I didn't even really have a ton of creatures in the deck. It was mostly just stuff that churned out, uh, my tokens faster and protected my commander. Cause Coma is so freaking busted. It's crazy. Not busted. I mean, it's a seven drop, but it's crazy how much is on that card. Um, especially in blue green, which is like, I don't know, blue green, needed another super powerful commander. Ah, Simic value. I mean, it's hard to beat really. Yeah. I like how he's like, just like, read the card. Of yeah. course I picked it. It's nuts. Yeah. That's a he's real, that's a real magic player right there is someone that's like, I want the value and I'm going to take it. He, he told me later that, um, he sort of realized, like, oh, yeah, it is a snake, Cobra Kai, but he didn't really think about that at first. <laughs> I just, mean, we didn't even really think no. about it in the game, and, like, all these snakes were being made, and none of us were like, wait a second. Yeah. <laughs> it's just coincidence. Uh, I did like that tweet that we made, though, about the Nick's Flick series, yes. Cobra Kai. I thought yeah. that was very well done, in case you didn't see that high, high-class high joke, you know, high-tier, high-level, <laughs> <laughs> gonna land us on SNL someday. So, Jimmy, let me ask you, you had Magda yes. as your commander. What made you choose... Uh, dwarf tribal or it's mono red so mono i guess we red, weren't yeah. super surprised but was that the reason you went with uh, magda it was part of it so the way that in case you don't know the way that works is josh will send out all of the commander options to everyone and we always let the guests choose first because you know we've been on this show plenty enough times we don't need to be calling dibs on the commander um so everyone chooses theirs and then when it gets down to us we go through the rest and the one that just it just stood out to me it it is magda because it is one mono red but the value that you can get off of this is unprecedented when it comes to this color. Um, you can tutor and you can ramp on the same card. It's like 
potentially one of the best mono red cards ever if you just think about it it's just like in a nutshell right compared to the last five years we don't have many things that do this amount of stuff so that just really excited me to build around it. i love dragons as everyone knows uh and i love mono red it's your two loves it's my two loves in the one commander i mean dwarves, i'll add that to it too I yeah <laughs> it, i mean you clearly chose correctly because the deck was sweet yeah, it's a lot of fun. Um, I'm really excited, actually. I was telling someone on Discord about this on our Discord for our patrons get access to. I want to do the same thing where, uh, you know, the Mael deck that Eric made? Yeah, yeah. Uh, oh, Oh, so you have like artifact creatures and dragons that Art, you yeah. randomly so, shuffle in each game so you don't know what's in there? Exactly. So you maybe have like 10 to 15 dragons uh, or maybe you have, sorry, like you have like 30 dragons and artifacts and every game you take out a certain amount and just randomly shuffle in the amount to fill it up and then just see what happens each game. Yeah, so you never know when you activate Magda what you've got access well, to yeah, in exactly. any given game. That's fun. That's cool. <laughs> That's kind of how it feels when I first build the deck and play it on game nights too because at that last final end step, I was like, I don't know what's in here, but I'm going to figure it out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, Josh, why did you you choose Yorn, not Jorn, apparently, by the way. That was a note <laughs> we had in the comments. Yeah, um, I mean, yes, let's start there. I clearly was mispronouncing, everyone was mispronouncing the name of Jorn, it's Yorn, uh, the entire episode. Whoops. The deck I built today is Jorn, God of Winter. Jorn, God of Winter. I will swing Jorn, God of Winter. Jorn will trigger. Jorn just bounces off. Jorn, 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 Jorn. The Jorn trigger will resolve. Yeah, so I don't know how I messed that up. I don't know how we messed that up. We've had Jesper Icing on our show. <laughs> he worked on our playmat. He's like a friend of ours. He's been on extra turns. It's clearly Jesper and not Jesper. That's such a good like, point. Like, how did we not know that? It's Nobody calls it Jockle Hops. It's Jockle Hops. Like, I know this. Wow. And yet, for whatever reason, we just called it Jorn the whole episode. So I feel a little bit ashamed about that. I'm sorry. Um, name aside, I chose Jorn because I think it's kind of obvious that I love the tapping untapping mechanic mm -hmm. in magic generally. Um, so this was a way to kind of try and abuse that in, in a different way, in a different manner. And so, and obviously it's very powerful to untap all your lands every turn. So yeah, I think had you survived a little bit longer, you would have been going off. Just that one turn that you were able to show what Yorn can do was definitely very impressive in and of itself. And you didn't even have, you know, all the pieces together, right? Yeah, I got to a slightly slow sp start, which ended up costing me. But at the same time, I, I think the deck um, can do some really cool stuff. I'm hoping to play to play it on an upcoming episode of Extra Turns. Ooh, uh, Just nice. to give it another chance. Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah, so hopefully it'll it'll have a little bit better showing. I mean, it still kind of showed the potential, but I think it, it obviously can do better. than Not to did. the full amount, yeah, yeah for yeah. sure. Uh, okay, and Rachel, she chose Toski. Uh, the squirrel, the indestructible squirrel, as she calls it, <laughs> as her commander. And we asked her why that was her choice uh, of the deck to build. Uh, there's a lot to love about Toski. Uh, at long last, he's a commander legal uh, legendary squirrel, but he's also very powerful. He's um, he's tricky to remove. He obviously can't be countered. Uh, he loves the combat step, like I do. Uh, and he has the potential to draw you a ton of cards. Uh, Obviously, that didn't happen in this game, but um, he he can do it. Um, but above all, I thought he just had like a fun energy, and I think he ultimately led to a very neat and silly build. And actually, Rachel, we we asked her a follow up question after she answered mm -hmm. why she chose Toski, which was you know she built the deck in a kind of a unique way. Yeah. I think the way when you look at Toski that most of us think of to build the deck is to go wide because you want to hit with a lot of creatures, right? Yep. yep. But she Draw decided, yeah, she decided to kind of lean into the Voltron aspect and the indestructible side. She she wanted to make a really big squirrel. So we asked her, you know, why she decided to build her deck in sort of such a unique way. Toski really wants to go wide to make a wide token board. So I included a number of cards that would do that to hopefully um, push through and draw some cards and uh, hopefully, you know, protect my life total uh, when Toski goes out attacking, which he has to do. Um, but ultimately, I kept coming back to this keyword indestructible, uh, and nothing made me laugh harder than a 2121 indestructible trampley squirrel damage. Um, I, I just couldn't really get that out of my head. So in the end, I did not build an optimized Toski list. I, I probably didn't even build an advisable Toski list, but I built the deck that made me laugh the most and made me want to play the most. Um, mostly I just wanted to put an Eldrazi conscription on a squirrel. <laughs> 
It's interesting because if you think about her appearance on Game Nights where she did win with the Chroma, that kind of has a similar feel to it, yeah. right? One really big, scary creature that gets buff uh, with all your keywords. So maybe Tolski was like a throwback to the Chroma, the good old Chroma days. Maybe. I, I like that <laughs> Rachel, she wants to build a deck that feels fun to her. It's not like, right. hey, look at this card. I got to build it the best way that according to what the rules text sta- says. She looks at it and goes, yeah, the rules, the rules text says all this stuff. But I think it would be fun to do this thing that's maybe a little off the beaten path, and I'm going to do that, which I think mm-hmm. is pretty cool. It speaks to her experience, too, right? Because yeah. I would say, like, if you're new, oftentimes it's easier to go the, like, all right, this is what's on the card. I'm going to go that direction. But Rachel knows the ins and outs of this game. So it was really cool to see her do that. She clearly loves the combat step. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> it's pretty good. Pretty good way to win the game. <laughs> <laughs> Turns out. Uh, okay. Although that's not how you won, Jimmy. <laughs> no, it isn't. Uh, it well, the direct. I guess damage is the is the way that thing that I'm obsessed with. Maybe maybe not combat so much. Okay, let's talk about the game. Some of the decisions, some of the ups, some of the downs, some of the successes, some of the mistakes. The most asked question. Let's just start with it. This yeah. was the most commented on thing. The most asked question the whole time. It was why didn't Jacob use Coma's ability at the very end? to stop Magda from being able to activate her ability. So, Jimmy, do you want to set the Mm -hmm. stage of of what it looks like before we kind of go into how this works? Yep. So, I have a bunch of stuff on my table, but the only thing that really matters is Magda, my commander. And then I have 10 treasure tokens on the battlefield, as well as one lithoform engine. And the lithoform engine got onto the table because I tutored it out the turn prior. So, what Magda says is you're allowed to sacrifice five treasures and then search your library for an artifact or dragon creature card and throw it onto the battlefield immediately. It's an activated ability. So, Coma has an ability as well that stops activated abilities. So, people were saying, well, this is clearly a misplay. Why didn't Jacob just stop Jimmy from using his commander? And that way he would have not lost the game in that fashion. Okay, great. Uh, At the end Uh, of your turn, I'm going to just see what kind of crazy stuff I can get, I guess. Uh, I have 10 treasures, so that means I can activate Magda twice. And then I'm going to use my Lithoform engine to copy the activated ability. So I'm actually going to search for three dragons or artifacts and put them onto the battlefield. Okay. I can't really stop him from activating Magda this many times, but anything he plays out, I can just tap down with Coma. Not feeling too scared. Yeah, Coma's ability, uh, you can sacrifice a coil, a serpent, and tap target, cre- target permanent, I believe, and its activated abilities can't be activated this turn. Mm-hmm. So people were like, well, why didn't he just use Coma to stop you from activating Magda at the end there when you went and got Blightsteel. Or even the Lithoform Engine. Right. So, well, Jacob actually explains this pretty well, so let, let's let him explain it. It's a weird interaction um, for this question because if Jimmy already has five treasures uh, on his battlefield, there's pretty much nothing I can do, or there is nothing I can do other than uh, having a spell like the, I think it was Sublime Epiphany that counters an act, uh, activated or triggered ability, I think it is. So Coma um, can tap down a creature and it won't be able to use activated abilities for that turn, I believe is the text. But if Jimmy already has the five tre- treasures out, he can just do that in response. So even if, in every scenario, if you know I try to, in his upkeep, you know, tap down Magda, he can just do that in response. If he does one of them, goes to copy it, you know, he can just keep doing it in response. So um, no matter what I would have done, when Magda activates her ability that goes on the stack, Coma's uh, sacrificing coils doesn't remove Magda's ability from the stack. So no matter what, I, I can, I can totally do that, but it, it wouldn't stop Magda's ability from happening. Yeah, so that explains it pretty well. There's there's actually, once Jimmy has the treasure and Magda on the board, there's not actually a way for Jacob, Jacob to stop yeah. Jimmy from activating Magna. Because here's the two scenarios. If I'm Jacob and Jimmy's Jimmy. Oh, thank goodness. What happens, Jimmy, if I do this? Okay. okay. Jimmy goes, he untaps. During his upkeep, I go, okay, I'm going to sacrifice a coil to Coma. Okay. And I'm going to target Magda to tap her down so her abilities can't be activated. Okay. You've done something that puts a trigger on the stack. I now have a chance to respond to it, unless you're going to hold the priority, but that doesn't matter here. In response to you doing that, I'm going to sacrifice five treasures twice to Magda's ability, putting both of those abilities on the stack. And then I'm going to, and then actually, I, I, let's say, let's go piece by piece. I sacrifice five treasures to Magda. Now what do you do? 
So your trigger goes on the stack that it's you're on the search. stack, right? Yeah. Even if I sacrifice another serpent to Coma targeting Magda, that'll go on the stack above Jimmy's ability. But his ability is already on the stack. It's going to happen no matter what. Yeah, because Coma's ability doesn't counter an ability on the stack. Correct. It means that Magda can't be activated, but that has to resolve. If he allowed the Coma trigger to resolve, now Magda couldn't be activated. But there's no reason for him to do that. He just activates in response before Coma's ability resolves. And he can basically always do that. Yep. So there's not really a way once Jimmy has the treasures on the battlefield for Jacob to stop the magda activations from happening. Yeah, the main thing here is that I need to have the treasures on the battlefield. If I had four treasures out and I went to tap a dwarf and then a boom, a trigger goes in the stack to make a treasure, Jacob can then go, okay, now I'm going to activate Coma to, to stop Magda. And before that treasure gets onto the battlefield, then it's going to stop and then the treasure comes out and then no longer can I use Magda. So the main thing and the reason why you watch me be very careful with my treasure count the whole game is that I knew this Coma could do this and I had to have treasures on the battlefield so I could activate the ability no matter what. And, and Jacob actually does this. There's a turn where on the end step, you use Dwarven Blood Boiler or something to make a bunch of treasures. Magda tra uh, triggers go on the stack to make those treasures. And in response to that, yes. Jacob uses Coma to tap Magda so you can't activate the ability that turn. Yep, yep. Yeah, but that's um, because the treasures aren't there yet, so you can't activate Magda in response. Yeah. And by the time... Uh, Coma's ability resolves first, then the treasures come into play, and now Magda's saying, well, I can't activate abilities. Yep, and the same logic goes to the Lithoform engine as well. Once I've activated Magda, no matter what, the Lithoform engine, even if Jacob sacrificed the Coma coil to stop that, I can tap that in response and copy the trigger that's on the stack. So once things are on the stack, very hard to interact with. Actually, one card that did stop it is the next one we're going to talk about, which is Sublime Epiphany. Yeah, that's true, because it says counter target activated ability on it so right it has the ability to once it's put on the stack get rid of it off the stack mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah so let's talk about the sublime epiphany timing because this is uh something a few people mentioned which was did i use my sublime epiphany at the wrong time so jimmy on your end step you went to activate Magda that first time. Mm -hmm. And because of table politics, I knew you were going to come at me with whatever came out because you basically made deals with both Rachel and yeah, Jacob. Yeah, Jacob's end step before my turn, so I could yeah. get haste. Yeah. At the end of your turn, I'm going to activate Magda's ability. Uh-oh. Sacrificing five treasures. I'm going to search for an artifact or dragon card, put it onto the battlefield, and then shuffle my library. Wow. All right, so here we go. Jimmy is going to tutor into his deck for his scariest thing, and I definitely can't let that happen because I'm like 90% sure that it'll be coming at me. How bad is this going to be? Uh, yeah, I don't know what's in this deck. Can you counter it? Uh, in response. Oh, no! I'm going to tap six. What? And I'm going to play Sublime Epiphany. Ooh. Wow. So I'm going to counter target activated ability on Magda, so no searching. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> come on. I'm gonna return target non land permit to its owner's hand, which will be my Ice Fang Coatl. Sure. I'm going to create a token that's a copy of target creature, which will be my Anthem Mutineer. And then I'm gonna draw a card. Wow. Oh no. So I knew like whatever he's getting is coming at me, so I gotta stop it. And I'd made the deal with Jacob, if everybody remembers, to not mess with it if I didn't try and counter his commander mm -hmm. earlier. So and Heinz and after the game, you knew that I also have a Blightsteel Colossus in my deck. So yeah. this is definitely. White I knew you had trigger. bad stuff, so it seemed like it was probably not. I didn't want Magda to resolve there or the, her ability to resolve. But a lot of people were asking, you know, why didn't I wait until Jimmy's turn mm -hmm. and then because I could see what he got, and Sublime Epiphany can still bounce whatever it is that Jimmy got. So did I make a mistake by using my Sublime Epiphany on Jimmy's end step? Y Regardless, J Jacob's end step. Jacob, end step, Jacob's yeah. end step, sorry, yeah. Regardless of what happened, because we know that there was a bunch of craziness with deflecting squad right. and Narset's reversal. I didn't know all that was going to happen. <laughs> no one did, honestly. Right. So, but still, was it maybe better to just wait? Because a lot of times with instance, you want to wait until the last minute to make mm -hmm. your decision. So I could have seen what he got and then still had my answer available to me. Does Sublime Epiphany let you bounce permanence? It, yeah, I bounce uh, a creature. A creature, yeah. I so, believe. I can bounce a creature, clone a creature, counter spell or activated ability, draw a card. Right. So... No, you can... Okay, so you can return the target non-land permanent. Non-land permanent. Yeah. There you go. Uh, I pose this question to everyone. What if I got something that had hexproof? Yeah. Right? That's like, a really good point. 
there are artifacts I can get that, you know, give hexproof to other things. Too. There's, there's lots of different things I could do. So I think you were totally right by doing that. Um, normally, when like someone casts a demonic tutor, the, right, the theory is you don't counter the tutor, you counter whatever's coming out next. But people forget what if that spell is uncounterable. You know, there's a lot of cards that can do that to cards in and have that on the text of cards as well. So I think the way you played it there was the best. I also, by countering Magda's ability, I left myself the bounce and the make a token copy of something right. as value that I could get. Because I was planning to make a token copy of my Ice Fang Quaddle or maybe my Amphim Mutineer and then bounce the other one so I could replay it yeah. and get the value. And so I was, you know, in my head, I was like, I'll stop his thing and still get basically like another card draw because the Ice Fang Quaddle or exile another permanent with, mm -hmm. whereas if I have, have to use the bounce on Jimmy, whatever Jimmy gets, um, then I can't use it on my own thing and I kind of lose that value. So it just seemed at that moment to me a, a better timing. Yeah, totally. Um, I think that makes perfect sense to me. Uh, and also like if you bounce it to my hand, I have it in my hand. I make treasures. I can just probably hard cast it too, right? That's so, a good point. So you don't want to just give me the tutor, even though people know what it is. You know, I, I'm in a deck that can potentially make a ton of mana. So doesn't seem like the smartest thing to wait in this case. All right, let's go to, speaking of doesn't seem like the smartest thing. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe not to you. <laughs> yeah, obviously it was because it worked out. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, right? Like you can make that argument in so many different ways because if it didn't work out, oh, everything's looking a little different. Okay, so this is, uh, we're going to call it Jimmy's Wheel. Woohoo! So after this whole thing goes down with my sublime epiphany, what ends up happening is Jacob uses Narset's reversal, makes himself a third coma. Mm-hmm. And is in a really dominating position. And on Jimmy's turn, uh, I'm thinking, okay, well, three comas is bad, pretty scary, but Sublime Epiphany is in my hand now. So what I can do is I can bounce the token copy of coma. I can copy my Ampha Mutineer and exile another coma. So I can get us down to one coma with the card that Jacob put back in my hand. Right. And then Jimmy casts Wheel of Fortune. Okay, I'm going to tap one, two, and sacrifice a treasure for red, and then cast Wheel of Fortune. Ooh. Wait, wait. I have one card. So this is like the worst Wheel of Fortune I can think of. I have an answer to two comas in my hand with that Sublime Epiphany, and now I'm gonna have to discard it? Jimmy, why? Which causes all of us to discard our hands and draw seven new cards. So I lose that answer to coma. Uh, I was pretty clear in the Game Nights episode that I was pretty frustrated that moment because I was like, no, we have an answer to the problems. Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> so I guess, Jimmy, do you want to explain yourself? Yes, I do. Okay, so... <laughs> Defend yourself, sir. <clears throat> I wrote down some notes here, and I did think about most of these when I was at the table. Uh, the number one biggest thing is I have one other card in my hand. I need to refill my hand, and red... I'm in a position where I don't get to do things like untap lands with Yorn or ramp like Jacob did. Like, I don't have those options available to me. So I, in my head, go, if I don't use my mana right now because I had the mana to do so, the three mana down next turn, as well as drawing those cards later, I think that's going to really throw me behind the pack. And I'm already behind the pack. Um, the second main point is that we all know the deck list beforehand. And I know that Josh has a Toxic Delusion in his deck. He's got other board wipes as well. So... You know, I'm hoping maybe Josh can draw into it. I know Sublime Epiphany answers too, but also if I let Josh cast Sublime Epiphany, he gets the other parts of the spell. He gets to draw a card and do all that stuff anyway. So I think for me, I was like, if I don't do this now, I'm putting myself really far behind. I think Josh can be fine in his colors and his situation, being able to potentially draw back. We saw him draw a ton of cards with, uh, you know, the, um, what was it? The pull from Eternity? Pull from Tomorrow. Pull from Tomorrow. Um, so he was already doing all that. So I was like, you know what? Josh is probably going to have the ability to refill his hand in some way. I don't think we have to worry too much because three coils now versus three coils later, I don't think it's going to make a huge crazy difference in terms of like how many turns it goes by. But for me, I had to draw it. And the third and final most point, uh, Rachel didn't, hadn't hit land drops right at that point. So I was like, you know what? Maybe she should draw some land. And she didn't, which is kind of crazy. Yeah. So, well, speaking of Rachel, let's hear what Rachel's <laughs> thoughts were of the Wheel of Fortune. Yes. Oh, man. Um, Jimmy's Wheel, as as much as I loved having a fresh hand, and I really did need one, uh, at that point, I was holding an Eldrazi Conscription and a Colossification and a Balagad's Recovery. So none of those cards are really doing anything for me with Coma on the board. Um, I really needed to get out from under coma and Josh's answer to two of them would have gone a long way to doing that. Um, and then the double whammy with that noxious revival, putting the fierce guardianship back in his hand. 
uh, into Jacob's hand. Boy, it was the wheel really did not go well for the table. I think uh, <laughs> overall, even though Jimmy did end up winning, so maybe it was the right choice for the wheel. Um, but I definitely would have preferred if he had saved it for the turn after, and uh, we had just handled two of the coma copies with the card we knew we had access to. I mean, she kind of says the same thing. It did work out for you. Yeah. Uh, but, but I think both Rachel and I are on the same page there. I'm like, no, wait, no, 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 no. Yeah. Um, it should have been a wheel of misfortune in hindsight, you know, so everyone could have not wheeled if they didn't want to. I mean, it's looking like a big brain play now. Yeah, I, I did, Although it didn't so. work out very well for me since no. I, just got, I just got murked right away. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but that happens. So you, so you, you would make that play again? I think so. Again, like, I only have one card in my hand, like, looking around the table, look, look how many cards Jacob has, look how many cards Josh has. Everyone has a full grip. And sure, I have this cool ability to tutor, but one board wipe, right? And I'm really far behind. So refilling my hand when I had the man to do so and not having to wait for it. And to me too, like the, the resource management of treasures is extremely important with this deck. So I wanted to make sure that I didn't have to waste treasures when I didn't need to. I will say in your defense here, or in your, uh, a point in favor of the decision is mm -hmm. also... At that moment, we just had a big sort of counterspell showdown. Right. And it left the two blue decks, me and Jacob, tapped out. Right. Uh, we'd used what appeared to be most of our resources. Obviously, if we had any more, we probably would have thrown them into there. Mm -hmm. So it was also a safe moment to cast the wheel because, man, it would really suck if you were like, okay, I'm going to let you get the Sublime Epiphany back and then I'll wheel on my next turn. And then it comes around, Jacob leaves his mana untapped and counters the wheel because he had plenty of cards because of the Consecrated Sphinx and the, right. uh, right. the Mystic Remora earlier and just shut you down to one card in hand for the rest of the game. Yeah. So like the fact that you had a window there that was pretty clear where it was going to resolve is also, I think, you know, important because it's a very big risk to take that it doesn't resolve later. And now you're just kind of out of that game probably, right? Like one card in hand for the rest of the game. Yeah, it's going to be tough because I don't really have great card draw things yeah. in my deck otherwise. So Because that was a three mana draw six. Yeah, and that's exactly when you want to do it. You want to dump it when your hand's low and you have the ability to refill. Not to mention, I also had that Dwarven guy on the battlefield that lets me exile creature cards from my graveyard. So, like, being discard right, like discarding stuff, like, in general, it's going along with my game plan is. Um, and, like, at the end of the day, he Jacob still would have had one coil or one coma, and that coma would have just repopulated the board again, and they just would have kept going. So. Sure, I don't think that argument really holds a lot of water, though. One coma is way less scary than three. Three is nuts. Three is the one that kind of is the reason you died. Like, yeah, next th turn, so. three is nuts, <laughs> but um, I mean, I still don't love it, obviously, from my seat, but from your seat, I can see it, uh, so I don't think it was a crazy decision. Yeah. Um, and That's like how a, Wheel of Fortune ticks, tends to go, right? One person's like, yes, or maybe two people are like, okay, and then the other two players are like, but my hand, I had so much stuff i mean and you're looking for that spot that's why you put it in your deck you're going to deploy and cast most of your cards so that when you cast it you get more cards than everybody mm -hmm. else and that's exactly the spot that you were in so yeah i mean like i said i don't like it but it worked out for you it did and uh yeah okay so we're gonna play wheel of misfortune next time so i don't have to go through ah, this wheel of misfortune don't do it not on game nights we'll take a half hour just explaining how the hell it works <laughs> hey, <laughs> at, least you get to, at least you get to keep your hand guaranteed so <laughs> All right, we got a bunch more uh, comments and questions to tackle coming up, including the second most asked question, which is about Mystic Reflection and how confusing it oh, is. Oh, yeah. Yeah, but before we get into that, let's take a quick break and hear a message from our sponsors. Hello, Sorak the Hunt Caller speaking. Sorak, it's me, Renata. Renata called to the hunt. Wasn't there going to be a hunt last weekend? You were supposed to call me. You're the Hunt Caller? Did you go to the hunt without me? Oh, gee, I'm sorry, Renata. I've been trying to make fewer calls, so I had to cancel the hunt. My wireless bills have been killing me. What? You need to switch to Mint Mobile. They're the online-only premium wireless company with plans starting at just $15 a month. All of their plans come with unlimited talk and text on the nation's largest 5G network. Yeah, but everyone already knows my old phone number, so you know. With Mint Mobile, you can keep your old number and all of your contacts. It'll save you money and we you won't have to skip any more hunts. Just make the switch. To get your wireless plan for just 15 bucks a month and get the plan shipped to your door for free, go to mintmobile.com slash command. That's mintmobile.com slash command. Cut your wireless bill to 15 bucks a month at mintmobile.com slash command. Hey, Surok, great hunt this weekend, bro. Wait, was that Garrick? I, I thought you said the hunt was canceled. Uh, I don't know who that was. Uh, you're, you're breaking up. Looks like I gotta go. Oh, he is so getting hunted. 
Okay, I'm gonna cast Rixmithese, the Slumbering Isle, and it gets five counters, and I will pass the turn. Okay, Josh, this is it. You've got a Rixmithese on the board and Peminzora in hand. Two card combo, infinite mana. You've just gotta untap next turn. Don't look suspicious. Come on, me. Act nonchalant. Josh has a combo kill. I'm gonna cast Chaos Warp on a Rixmithese. What? How'd you know? I was so careful. Well, I've played that deck before, and you left your hand face up on the table. We can see your cards. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Crap. Magic players know information is valuable. You wouldn't let other players see your hand. So why let internet service providers see every single website you visit online? That's why we use ExpressVPN, the VPN we know and trust to protect ourselves on the internet. ExpressVPN creates a secure encrypted tunnel for your data. It's easy. Just install the ExpressVPN app, press one simple button, and you're protected. So if you're like us and believe your online activity is your business, secure yourself by visiting expressvpn.com slash command today. Use our exclusive of link expressvpn.com slash command and you can get an extra three months free. That's expressvpn.com slash command. Hey, can we just agree not to tell Jimmy about this? No, oh, I'm already texting him. I am Sir Conrad, called the Grim, and any who enjoy a fright should seek me when the lights go dim to join Sir Conrad's movie night. But where is it that I must go to find the films that make you scream? For scary movies, chilling shows, why, Shudder is the place to stream. Spine-tingling classics that must be seen, like John Carpenter's Halloween. And Shudder exclusive shows for you, A Nightmare Wakes and Shook are two. Get started streaming the best horror, thriller, and supernatural content. Shudder's expertly curated collection includes must-see titles like Color Out of Space, Hosts, The Mortuary Collections, plus all the best horror documentaries and the hit Creepshow TV series from executive producer Greg Nicotero. To try Shudder free for 30 days, go to shudder.com and use promo code COMMAND. That's Shudder.com, promo code COMMAND. So call your friends and steal your nerves. Grab your popcorn and hors d'oeuvres. Then go to Shudder from AMC and stream great horror all ad free. <laughs> all right, we are back. This is Roundtable Game Night's Kaldheim edition. If you're still watching this and haven't watched the game, then I don't know what's going on. What are you doing? Maybe they just really like hearing us talk about stuff they don't, they haven't even seen yet. I mean, if they like that, they'll like hearing us talk during game nights about hey, the game that we're playing. Point. So. That's a good point. And it's got music and yeah. sound effects and cool graphics. <laughs> cool animations, yeah. Um, okay, so this next thing up is a question that was directed at Jacob's board. So Jacob has three comas out and Josh is trying to get rid of them in any way he can. This is actually right after the wheel, right, that we were just talking about. Um, and specifically, Jacob has a card that I love called Sakashima out and this prevents certain things from happening. However, Josh plays a phantasmal image, he uses it to copy his mutineer, and then it exiles Jacob's Sakashima copy. There's so many copies running around, it's really hard to keep track of. There's jo a token copy of the Sakashima, there's a Sakashima copy, and then there's the original coma. Oof. Okay, uh, I guess I'm gonna pay two, and I'm gonna play phantasmal image. Okay. Oh, shoot. Uh, so I'm gonna copy the Ampha mutineer, which means when it ETBs, I get to exile something that's not a salamander. So that'll exile Sakashima, that's a coma. Bummer. Uh, but you'll get a 4-3 Salamander. <sighs> Come on. Yeah, I think you're gonna be fine. So the question was, when I get rid of the Sakashima, why doesn't uh, Jacob have to sacrifice one of the remaining two Comas to the legendary rule because uh, they are legendary. So, well, Jacob uh, is gonna come in here and help explain this for us. The reason I didn't have to sacrifice uh, one of my comas when Josh exiled uh, the Sakashima is because I didn't, when I made the copy token, I didn't have it copy the coma, I had a copy of Sakashima. So I had a coma, um, I had a Sakashima, which was a copy, and Sakash Sakashima specifically says that the legend rule doesn't reply. So that's why I chose to copy the Sakashima so that if um, someone killed the Sakashima, I would have another one saying that the legend rule doesn't apply. So if one of the Sakashimas dies, I still have a token of coma with the legend rule doesn't affect me so that I can keep multiples of my legendary creature. Yeah, so when Jacob had made his token copy, he'd made the token copy of the Sakashima copy, mm -hmm. which means that the token says... The legendary rule does not apply. He did that on purpose, like he said. Um, I believe he said that. For this you know, exact moment. For this exact scenario. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, this exact scenario. A few people did ask, I want to I cover this real quick, why I didn't phantasmal image the coma. 
Ah. And start making my own serpents. The problem is Phantasmal Image has that downside. Yeah. Where Once if it, it becomes targeted. targeted yeah. Well, Coma is over on uh, Jacob's side of the battlefield and has a very easy targeting mechanic. Mm-hmm. So basically, if I ta- copied Coma with the Phantasmal Image, Jacob just gets to, before my turn even ends, sack a coil and kill it. Whoops. So it bad. seemed like a better idea to kill a coma. Um, but here's another interesting que- question that was asked. And I didn't really even think of this at the time, but I think... I didn't either. Yeah. I think, yeah, this is valid. So why didn't I exile the commander, the original coma, with my phantasmal image copy of the Ampha Mutineer? So if you look at Jacob's board at this point in the game, it's got three comas, some coils. And my brain, I'm thinking, okay... I want to get rid of one. If I get rid of the commander, it goes back to the command zone. So he can recast it. Mm -hmm. He still has access to it. So my brain immediately says, I don't want to get rid of the commander. If I get rid of the token or the Akashima, they're kind of the same. However, I have bounce in my deck and bounce kills tokens. Whereas Bounce doesn't kill Sakashima's, mm-hmm. it just bounces back to the hand in which he can replay. So it seemed in my mind best to get rid of the Sakashima Exile copy, leave the token as something that's easier for my deck to maybe draw into a removal four because my Bounce will also kill it. Mm-hmm. However, didn't think about this. Some people pointed out, if I exile the Commander Coma, it turns off Fierce Guardianship. Yeah, the Fierce Guardianship that he just got back to his hand when I wheeled because he had that Noxious Revival. So think of, that makes a pretty big change because Fierce Guardianship ends up being what kills me because I have Mystic Confluence in my hand later mm-hmm. and I can't get it off because he counters it, but I can bounce his stuff with Mystic Confluence. So I actually think this is a really valid... Um, thing for people to point out and a total misplay and mistake on my part and might probably leads to me surviving in this game if i think down that line of play but it did not occur to me the text on fierce guardianship in my head just reads it costs zero right it's but it says if you control your commander you don't have to pay the mana cost and jacob's commander was the original coma that had been copied twice and it can only copy or only counter a non-creature spell yeah so it can't counter the phantasmal image so, yeah, totally a mistake on my part and, yeah, a big that's, misplay. That's tough because I do, right, the reasoning you laid out was, is perfect. You have bounce spells. You got all these ways to get rid of those token copies where they go away forever. Let's not give the one where he can just recast it because of all his mana or whatever. Yeah, but I, I needed to be thinking about, like, well, it's I might die now. Right. So, it might be best to just save my butt and, like, bite the bullet and be like, yeah, he's going to have three comas again on his turn, but mm-hmm. at least I survived. Um, so, pretty interesting. Okay, this next one is definitely the question that got asked the second most, and it's on a brand new card, which makes complete sense. And, and a confusing card. And a confusing card that, yeah, the wording on this, even when I read it now, I'm still kind of like, what is exactly going on with this? Um, it's Mystic Reflection Confusion. Confusion. So let's set the stage here. Jacob, later on in the game, has two comas left, because I've exiled the one. It's uh, Jimmy's upkeep, I believe. And the two coma triggers go on the stack. So two three threes are getting made for Jacob. And before they enter the battlefield, uh, Jacob foretells or unfortells. Mm -hmm. I don't know. He he casts it for its foretell cost. He casts it for its foretell cost, mystic reflection in response to the token. So they're they're on the stack. They they haven't come into uh, play yet. And then he gets a copy of Avenger of Zendikar with the first... Uh, serpent that comes in the battlefield. So instead of becoming a serpent, it becomes an Avenger of Zendikar because of Mystic Reflection, makes a bunch of plant tokens. But the second token only comes in as a 3-3 serpent. And everybody was like, wait, shouldn't have, shouldn't Jacob have gotten two Avenger of Zendikars because of the two tokens? Mm-hmm. Jimmy, do you want to read Mystic Reflection? I do. So Mystic Reflection, brand new card, one in the blue for an instant. Choose target non-legendary creature. In this case, Jacob chose the Avenger of Zendikar. The next time one or more creatures or planeswalkers enter the battlefield this turn, they enter as copies of the chosen creature. And then the foretell cost is blue, so you can cast the spell uh, face down for two mana, generic mana, and then at any point um, you can pay a blue mana to cast it because it's an instant. Do you want to read that the next time thing again? Yes. So again, choose target non-legendary creature. The next time one or more creatures or planeswalkers enter the battlefield this turn, they enter as copies of the chosen creature. 
Okay, uh, I will untap. On your upkeep, both my combers are gonna trigger again. But with those triggers on the stack, I'm gonna play my other foretell card, which is Mystic Reflection. Oh, this is a brand new card from Kaldheim and it's really interesting because this has great synergy with Jacob's deck. He knows he's gonna be making tokens all the time and now he can switch it to something else that's really powerful on the board. So nice play. Okay, so Jacob uh, is here to help us explain how this worked. We'll keep Mr. Reflection up on screen while he does this. Uh, let's go. Let's see how Jacob does here because it's hard to explain. Yeah, no kidding. The reason I didn't get two Adventure of Zendikars is because of the specific wording on uh, Mystic Reflection. So even though I'm creating or I have multiple creatures entering the battlefield, Mystic Reflection's text, text specifically says the next time. So it doesn't count that second or third or however many creatures I'm gonna put in. It's just that one creature that's entering in at that moment. Um, so that's why I didn't get two, but I did get the one which, you know, would have been cool if Jimmy didn't wombo combo uh, <laughs> defeat me with throwing a blight steel at my face, which is pretty, uh, that guy's so good. Dang. He's just, yeah. Shout out you, Jimmy. That was, that was pretty good. All right. Well, he did a pretty good job. I think the confusion is two phrases, right? Yep. The next time and one or more. So people were like, it says the next time one or more. Well, it's one or more. It's two. Two. Yeah. Yeah. The problem is it says one or more. It doesn't really mean it means from one effect. So one or more, the next time one or more actually means the next single instant instance of a creature coming into the battlefield, if that's one creature or a bunch of creatures. Right. Like but remember, play, in a single instance. Yeah. So if you play a card like Secure the Wastes, X and a white, it makes that many. So then that is a one or more where they all enter simultaneously. Right. Right of replication, all, although I guess why would you do that? Uh, maybe your opponent's right of replication. Um, mm -hmm. Avenger of Zendikar, you can kind of do it in response to the plant tokens being made because the right. plant tokens all come in at the same time and that would that's one or more. But the problem is that the two serpents are two separate triggers. So only one of those is going to be the next time because coma triggers, coma triggers again, the next time one or more that's the first one resolving for first 3-3. Three, three. It becomes an Avenger of Zendikar. Now, Mr. Reflection, Reflection is done. Done for, yeah. It said the next time happened, one thing came in. You got an Avenger of Zendikar. I'm not still a persistent effect that's going to make every creature that comes in for this turn mm -hmm. into the thing. And so the second serpent just comes in as a serpent. Yeah. Now, what Jacob could have done is have, uh, you know, if he had his own Avenger of Zendikar, right, then he plays it and the Avengers Zendikar card trigger goes on the stack. In response to that, he could flip a Mystic Reflection targeting his own Avenger of Zendikar. Then those tokens are not plants. Now they're all individual Avengers of Zendikars. But because it was Rachel's Avenger and not his own, he couldn't sequence it that way. Right. Yeah, it would have been tough. I guess his Sakashima or something could have copied it. Yeah, right. And then in response to, like, the, the copy comes in, says, I'm going to make the plants. Is the Sakashima still legendary after it copies it? Uh, no, it says it's not legendary. It says the legendary Rule doesn't, doesn't matter. Apply, but, yeah. but, uh, I mean, Mystic he would have to bounce the Sakashima back to his hand, replay it at targeting the Avengers Zendikar for this to happen. Yeah. But yeah, yeah. Actually, you're right. The Sakashima would lose its legendary creature subtype when it copies something else. Yeah. And it would still have the legendary creatures uh, or legendary rule doesn't affect you anyway. Yep. Yeah. But yeah. Well, well, with Mystic Conf or Mystic Reflection, you can't target a legendary creature. Right, 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 right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So pretty interesting anyway i know that's confusing a lot of people asked about yeah, it but yeah. yeah the next time is really the next instance, instance yeah. of at least one creature entering and then anytime another instance of creatures entering it doesn't see it anymore yep 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 hopefully we explain that well i think i think so it's a very complicated card because just the way it's phrased and the types of cards it works with so again this card works mystic reflection works great if you're creating a bunch of tokens simultaneously attached to a single trigger then you can take all of those copies enter as a copy of something else all right, let's go to the next uh, commented on thing, which was, how close-key was Toski? <laughs> I just came up with that. That was really good. It's not even in the outline. <laughs> it says, how close was Toski? But yeah. I was like, that actually rhymes. <laughs> how close-key was Toski? So near the end of the game, Rachel mentions that uh, she can get Toski up to 18 power. This is when Jacob's kind of in control of the game. He has three comas, tons of serpents out, uh, but... No flyers. Yeah, Rachel's Toski has canopy cover, which means Jacob can't block it. And if she could get up to 21 
damage, she could commander damage him out on the spot. And she goes into the tank and she's she's a Voltron deck, so she's doing all the math. And she says in the interviews uh, that she can only get Toski up to 18 power, can't quite get to 21. Mm-hmm. Uh, and there are a lot of people wondering what it is she has in her hand at that moment that can get Toski that high. So uh, I guess we'll let Rachel talk about what she had in her hand at that moment. So... At that very at that pivotal turn for me, the when I untapped with a hexproof Toski, I knew I was like, okay, I have to get Toski to twenty one, and I was doing so much in my head. I was doing so much math. I was going through my cards. I played the Sedison training because it drew a card and then drew a card off of my Enchantress. I was like, I have to get to twenty one, and was so zeroed in on this math. And I did have some of the answers. Um, I had a Rancor, would have, which would have made him a, uh, it would have done 10 damage. I had a Snakeskin Veil, which puts a plus one counter on him. And most importantly, I had a Might of Oaks, which would have given him plus seven, plus seven at instant speed. Um, unfortunately, that only adds up to 18, uh, which isn't enough. Uh, the funny thing about the number 18 is it actually would have killed Jacob if he hadn't blocked Toski on that earlier turn when you put the salamander in front of it. So uh, it just goes to show the commander damage is very relevant. <laughs> That's a Voltron deck, all right. Mm-hmm. So she just needed to get that up to 21, really close, but 18, eh, no, you know, one is not zero, as they say. I like how she pointed out that uh, if Jacob hadn't blocked Toski earlier in the game with that salamander that he got from the Amphimunir, right. Uh, if he just decided to take the damage, and I think it wouldn't have been crazy at that point to just take it and keep your creature, right? Uh, definitely not, yeah. Then she would have already had some commander damage marked on him, and he would have died to the 18 damage. So that block right. saved him. Yeah. Uh, and good thing he did, because obviously Coma makes all of those 3-3s. Three you don't care about that 4-3 from Josh there. So yep. good play by Jacob seeing that, even though he didn't know, right? Right. Um, okay, so the next thing's kind of related. The next comments mm-hmm. were, all right, so, well, if Rachel can get Toski up to 18 damage... Then why didn't she ask you, Jimmy, to use your Dwarven Blood Boiler to help pump Toski up the rest of the way? Because we saw later in a big attack that you did use the Blood Boiler to, to try help and help a her. bunch of her creatures trade with Jacob. Yep. It didn't work because of her heroic intervention, but you know we saw that you did use it to sort of you know help her while mm-hmm. she was attacking Jacob. So why not have you uh, help in this instance? And yeah, yeah. Once again, uh, we have a clip here um, from Rachel explaining why that wasn't a possibility. I did not ask Jimmy to pump Toski on that turn because he was unable to. Toski had Hexproof, uh, which as much as I would have loved him to be able to give it plus two, plus so a couple of times, uh, he is not able to target Toski at that moment because of the canopy cover. Ah, that fun old word that we all love to see. We hate to see it. It's Hexproof. So again, it's on Rachel's board. Even though I'm trying to be her teammate, I cannot target it. And right. Dwarven Blood Boiler specifically targets creatures. Yeah, even if he's trying to help her, he's still her opponent. So mm-hmm. he's still not allowed to target Toski because of the canopy cover, yeah. which doesn't actually say hexproof, but says the same words. Uh, you know, this creature cannot be the target of spells or abilities your opponent's control, which is what hexproof is. Yeah, so unfortunate because otherwise that would have been another way to take Jacob out early in this game. Although I guess, Jimmy, it yeah. worked out for you, so it wasn't that unfortunate. No, I guess not. But I thought it was a cute interaction when I did help her blockers out and we did all this math and the heroic intervention came down. I was like, oh, why did we have to Why? think so hard? Yeah, Jacob, just say you have it, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Stop thinking about it, guys. I got this covered. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, oh, yes. This is my next favorite one point to talk about in every round table. How good did the animations get this time? Because they've been on an upward trend, if you have not noticed. And this time, I believe, is the single greatest episode of animations because we added 3D elements this time to our mana rocks, to our treasure map. Wow. What a show. <laughs>
Yeah, really, you know, Sam, Jake, the whole team always up in their game every episode. A lot of people have noticed that. We took a pretty big step, I'd say, this episode. Like you said, Jimmy, Mm -hmm. they started using some 3D, building some 3D models of stuff. Um, We forgot to ask Jacob and Rachel this question, but Jimmy, I'll Mm. ask you, what was your favorite animation in the episode? I already mentioned it. I think it's got to be Treasure Map. I've never seen an animation of a card that did that. (laughs) And even when I watched that gasp, I was like, oh! Sam figured it out. <laughs> that was like one of my head. the paper? It's just, yeah, you it's, know, it's, it's a, a 2D piece, image. It's an art, yeah. But no, Sam went in there and they, he modeled it and made it happen. And it, everything combined together for that one really beautifully, I think. I think mine was the thought vessel. Yeah. <laughs> there was something just so satisfying when it clicks into place. It's yeah. like when you finish a Rubik's Cube. <laughs> you know, it's just... <laughs> yeah, some just, kind of puzzle, yeah. Yeah, I got that, 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 that just satisfied feeling when it just <laughs> crunched into place. Yeah. Uh, really, really cool, cool. stuff. We're really definitely cool. going to be using more 3D uh, moving forward just because it's something Sam's learning more and more about. So pretty cool. Mm-hmm. Uh, I did want to talk about some stuff here that, you know, people probably didn't know about. There was a few people that noticed um, some that there were some things going on, but I don't think they caught all of it. So there were some Easter eggs kind of planted in the animations. And this is something fun that uh, Jake and Sam started doing. This is mostly Jake coming up with this stuff. Uh, so something to look look for in future episodes probably jake's having a lot of fun doing this uh these little easter eggs so we're gonna let jake kind of talk through there's two animations toski and the consecrated sphinx where there were some sort of hidden easter eggs in there so take it away jake hey everybody it's jake i'm an editor on game nights and uh we did a lot of fun stuff we did some easter eggs on this episode the first one is going to be toski uh so we're going to take a look at it forward and then we're going to play it in reverse a couple of times and let's see if you can catch what uh toski's saying So you'll notice that the uh, critter sounds and the whispers are the famous Ashlyn Rose, our resident voice actress, who's really talented. And the whispers are being played in reverse, which is a really fun trick that I first saw on Lost. Um, And it makes like a nice mysterious thing. But what's being said in reverse is uh, don't trust Valky. Since Toski is the bearer of secrets, I figured the secret is probably don't trust Valky, the god of lies. So that's really fun. But now we're going to take a look at Consecrated Sphinx, which has a couple of things going on. So whenever we animate a card that's going to be a staple for the format that we're definitely going to see again, we try to do something special. And for this one, we went back to one of my favorite lines from the holiday 2019 episode. Uh, and then we garbled it up for the basic VO and all that stuff. So let's take a look at the evolution of that line and how it became the Consecrated Sphinx line. I have all the cards in the world. I have all the cards in the world. So we took that line, the I have all the cards in the world line. We speed ramped it, pitch shifted it, uh, did some distortions, some flangers and compressors and echoes and all kinds of fun stuff uh, to make it sound Phyrexian. And it's layered and it's actually being played forward and backwards at the same time. Uh, I just love mashing effects and kneading the dough and making it this uh, thing that I'm really proud of at the end here. Um, But now we're going to take a look at the Phyrexian text, which actually says something. And uh, I'm proud of our commenters. Somebody actually caught what it said. It says, all your cards are belong to us, which is a classic uh, as old as the internet meme. And they even caught that I couldn't find a lowercase L and I had to use a capital L for the Phyrexian. So hats off to you. I'm really impressed. But next time it's not going to be as easy. I'm going to try to make it a little bit harder. So keep your eyes peeled. Yeah, so pretty cool. You know, we're always trying to come up with what the characters are saying and everything. Uh-huh. And for Toski, that you hear that whispering because, you know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And for that to be, don't trust Valky because Valky is the god of lies. Yep. But in this case, it's actually Tybalt. Yeah. So uh, that was don't trust Valky in reverse. And then the Consecrated Sphinx I thought was funny because that's me from the holiday episode last year saying, I have all the cards in, in the, the world. world. Yeah. And just garbled sequence. it so hard that it sounded like Phyrexian yeah. speak. I also love the little glitch animations that they played on top because um, it is Phyrexian after all. Good Pretty job. cool stuff. Good job, Jake. Good job, Sam. Yeah, I love that. Okay. All right. All right. Well, we like to always ask what our favorite moments are from the game. So let's throw it away to Jacob first as our newest guest. What was your favorite moment from this last game of Game Nights? Honestly, my favorite moment in the game was uh, getting to politic with everyone. Uh, 
<laughs> like, you know, telling Josh, like, hey, like, I'll, if you don't kill my consecrated sphinx, I'll give you a firm handshake. I just feel like that's I, I'm going on the show, you know, knowing, I mean, I've seen, I've watched all the episodes and I've been a fan for a while. So knowing how good uh, Josh and Jimmy are, and then, you know, seeing the uh, episode with Rachel where she played the Boros deck, I was like, you know, pretty intimidated. So I was like, all right, I'm going to do some good old politicking, you know, uh, see what I can do. Uh, so that was pretty fun. I think just hanging out with everyone was awesome. Yeah. And he did a really good job with the politicking. Yeah, he did. I mean, I, I, he, he came in and he was dropping like catchphrases from the show. <laughs> he was doing the sound effects. It was great because you knew that Jacob, he really knew his stuff. And that, that is, that makes a huge difference at the end of the day. I just liked to go into political mode. Okay. <laughs> You know, you're like, oh, here we go. There's a the, deal coming. The firm yeah. handshake. Really, <laughs> that 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 had a lot of repercussion throughout that game. We actually got lucky because he's Cobra Kai. He could have offered, you know, a firm punch to the throat or right. something. You yeah, know? No, so. thanks. <laughs> Don't want any of that. Uh, let's hear what Rachel's favorite moment in the game was. My favorite moment in the game, I, I mean, I loved Jimmy's win at the end. Uh, for most of the game, it felt like there was just no hope against all of the comas and the coils and the comas and the coils. Uh, so for Jimmy to pull out a win at the end with his mono red dwarf deck, uh, that was very exciting for me, uh, especially because, you know, my eight squirrel damage did help him get there. Aw, thanks, Rachel. You know, from one winner to the next, I got you. So that, that's, that feels like kissing up. <laughs> I gotta say. No, game recognized game, you know? <laughs> uh, game recognized game. Okay, how about you, Josh? What was your favorite moment here? Uh, I loved the complicated stack interaction with Sublime Epiphany. Yeah. Then you developing swat it, that it gets Narset reversal. I mean, that, let's be honest, didn't work out very well for me. <laughs> but it was it was pretty complicated. You were really smart how you used your Vault Robber to put an activated ability on the stack so you'd have a target for Sublime Epiphany that wasn't Magda. Yeah, we had I, to sit there and think about it for a bit, too. How do we make this? How do I make this? figure how do i work it out yeah yeah so uh, that was really cool I, I just liked that complicated stack interaction even though it didn't go my way so <laughs> that was probably my favorite moment yeah and it would have been my favorite moment too but actually my favorite moment comes later when jacob has redrawn his fierce guardianship and he just he just slaps it on the table when he casts it and goes fierce guardianship bop and you hear it hit the table and i know a lot of people some people commented on it as well but i was like dang the sheer confidence and audacity with which he did that because you, we don't play too many counter spells on game nights and he just was just like nope absolutely not well we knew it was coming i don't even think i finished the word confluence out of mystic confluence i was like mystic connie's like fierce guardianship yeah <laughs> i think we had to go in later and let me say it like okay everybody quiet while i just say the word so we have that audio for the edit yeah <laughs> but yeah definitely i mean like again for a first time player on the show too to come in with that gusto i know some people are like oh i don't like it but like no i i love that sort of stuff after all this is a game show you know we're not no one's walking out of here angry at the other person it's it's all in good fun so moments like that i think really add to the sort of like the the world of each show yeah a little gusto is totally fine and we're all friends here we're all having a good time yeah all right, let's talk about the regrets, the errors, the misplays. We asked each player, you know, did you make any mistakes during the match that you think, you know, might have cost you the victory? Now, mm -hmm. Jimmy, you couldn't have made a mistake that cost you the victory because you did win in the Correct. end. Correct, yeah. But, you know, did you, was there still any misplays or mistakes that you made that you, you know, I think we're always looking to better ourselves, right? And uh -huh. play better magic. Was there any mistake or misplay that stood out to you in, in your gameplay that you wish, yeah. you know, you'd done differently? I think in general, there's always something that you could have done better in any given game. Um, so arguably the Wheel of Fortune might have been a misplay if, if you know, arguably. Um, and I had a Wayfarer's Bubble I played on turn one and got really excited about and never cracked once. Oh yeah, a lot of people asked about that. Was that because of Gadrak? You wanted the extra no, artifact around? It, or? Because uh, I had, you know, I already had, a, and people didn't notice that I had one of my first lands I played was the artifact red land so right. i had artifacts out and i was going to make treasures this was actually because i just never found a good spot to do it I, I watched the game and i looked out do i ever have two mana that i'd rather use for the wayfarer's ball than whatever i did in the game and i don't think that answer for me was yes so i think i just had so much so little man to work with and so specifically you know, i needed to have it for all those instances yeah and, and you don't want to spend the treasure on it necessarily because if you're close to five treasure yeah. it's much better to just get a blight steel colossus or something out than it is to yeah. get an extra land into play at that point right maybe maybe my uh, my the mistake i can look back on most is how i politicked because jacob definitely sort of took over that aspect of the game and i didn't have much maneuverability in there to be like hold on hold on maybe i should you know make this more in my favor or whatever it was i just didn't really fight that fight this game hmm. well speaking of jacob 
Let's ask him what mistakes or misplays he thought he made that may have cost him the victory in this game. You know what's funny? Uh, I don't know why. I think I said it a couple times in the game uh, where Jimmy keeps attacking me twice with his Gadrick. Uh, and I was like, oh, I don't have a flyer, so I guess I'll take it. And I don't know why I didn't think of tapping him down. I mean, I started, I think I took two hits from the Gadrick before I started tapping it down. But I think if I would have. I mean, I would have lived if if I had stopped uh, one of the, one more gadget. But I mean, hindsight is twenty twenty. Who who knew that he would throw a blight steel colossus and I forget the name of the other Phyrexian thing that he threw at my face. But uh, in hindsight, I guess yeah, I probably could have um, tapped down the gadget earlier to prevent damage. Um, but other than that, I don't really think I made too many misplays. I think I. Um, played decently streamlined. I think I probably could have attacked Jimmy a little more, um, made him block with some of his dwarves. Um, I think I killed Josh at the right moment. I think to me, Josh was the biggest threat just cause he was in black. Um, he was in black and blue, which are, you know, like the best, he was honestly soul ties the best color combination. Like, I'm sorry, red and white. I love playing red and white, but it's just the best. So I was, I was pretty intimidated about by him and especially cause he had that, um, the ability to just double his mana and he's Josh Lee quiet. I mean, that man's value on value on value. So sorry, dude, had to, had to take you out first. Mm. It's a really interesting one. I didn't really think about, but yeah, now that, now that I'm, I'm thinking back, he did take a couple of hits from Gadrak yep. throughout the game and, Every point of damage mattered in that game. Yeah, he didn't need to. There was many. There was a few turns, especially near the end. There's a couple turns where he wasn't able to attack with a lot of his serpents. He mm -hmm. always had some lying around. So the cost of two serpents probably would have been worth it to save the 10 life, right? Yeah, would that have saved your life? Because that would have been less things to attack you with? Because that may have changed some things around, so... Maybe, but I know he got hit twice, so at least right. one of the times... Yeah, yeah. He, Even just once, he, that would He maybe could have, yeah. Yeah, totally. Yeah, that's interesting, because he, he died to Exaxes at the end. Yep. Um, so if he even had one more life, I think it's possible he lives there. Yeah, totally. So, because I, I don't think you had another way to get in with damage. Nope. So, yeah, pretty interesting to think about. Um, let's talk about mine. We already talked about it, so I'm not going to go in depth, but I do think that me not removing the commander version of Coma with my phantasmal image was my biggest mistake. Mm -hmm. Because again, I had Mystic Confluence in my hand and right. he went to attack me for lethal. And if I could have bounced three things, then I would have survived. Yeah. yeah and totally. I actually probably would have done it on the end step of Rachel's turn just because he's still tapped out and everything. Right. So Fierce Guardianship's just stranded in his hand. Or not stranded. You know, obviously you can use it later. But it wouldn't have done any good with no com coma on the battlefield. Yeah, you can recast it and maybe get me next turn. But that gives me a whole untap step. And, you know, the battlefield can look a lot different. Maybe all of a sudden he's worried about you two. He can't expend as many resources on me. And he's definitely still the arch enemy at that point, yeah. too. So Rachel and I are clearly going to stay focused on him. Yeah, so that could have definitely changed the outcome of the game and just a mistake on my part. Yep. Rachel, let's go to Rachel here because she's going to kind of drop a bombshell. She's going to talk about uh, what she had in her mm -hmm. hand at the end there and, and her mistake. What, she didn't tell us till after the game. Uh, she was like, I had this in my hand. And we were like, wait, what? Mm. That's crazy. So, yeah, let's let her talk about it. And so... It, it kills me to admit that I absolutely punted on that final turn. Um, I, the turn I untapped with, with Toski, I knew I needed to find a way to get him to 21. And even after scrying and then drawing after a set of some training, just the math just wasn't, it wasn't adding up. So I just attacked and I drew a card and I was like, you know, all I can do is survive this turn. And I looked at the board and I just missed that Jacob had lethal. It, he had one card and a dice that said 13 on top of it. And I looked at my board and I was like, I have more cards on the board. <laughs> so I must be able to block all of the damage that was coming at me. And I was really just relying on untapping with Toski. I was, I was just, my board just looked big enough to block his. <laughs> I was so busy doing the math to get Toski to 21 that I missed that Jacob had lethal damage on hand. So I just played the scariest thing in my hand, which was Vigor. What I should have done and what the audience does not know, um, but what I should have done is hold up mana for the best card in my hand, which was Arachnogenesis. 
Arachnogenesis would have saved my life from that combat and it would have left Jacob in a very vulnerable position and would have set me up to potentially win on my turn. Um, so it was pretty brutal uh, misplay on my part. Um, it just goes to show that math really is for blockers. You just need to make sure you've done that math ahead of time. <laughs> so there was nothing I could do. I could do about it with all of my land staff. Oh, man, that would have been the perfect answer to a bunch of creatures attacking you. I mean, she would have made a spider for every, every creature coil. attacking her. Yeah. She probably would have. Well, he, we know he had heroic intervention, so he probably saves all his stuff. But now all of a sudden she has a crackback that's insane. Mm -hmm. And he's going to have real trouble getting through all of that. Yeah, and even if she doesn't crack back with the tokens, she has her Toski, and Toski can just still smack Jacob. And at that point, if she had actually 18, he was he was dead to Toski, right? Yeah, because yeah, she'd already smacked him for eight, and now she can do the eighteen, and it does bring him above twenty one. And then how do I take her out? I don't know. Yeah, because she was at a pretty decently high life total when he yep. takes her out, so you might not have been able to tear over the peaks her out. Mm -hmm. And with all the spiders and everything, she might have won the game on the basis of that. I think it's really easy to get tunnel vision, and she explains it uh, in the clip, mm -hmm. how she was trying to get Toski up to a certain amount, and when that wasn't going to work, she just kind of, you know, guesstimated how many creatures everybody had and says, eh, it looks fine, I'm going to play Vigor, which Vigor is a very powerful card it's just nobody really thought oh he's got so many more creatures that he doesn't have to care about vigor he can just go around it yeah very interesting I and mean, like the again math at that point it was at the end of the game so much was going on vigor seemed like the perfect thing there and again what if rachel had just hit a few more land drops that game yeah she would have been able to play vigor and hold up the arachnogenesis yeah so. true it only would have been a couple more mana i think yeah. we've all been there where it's like after you make the play you kind of start looking around and you're like, oh, I should not have done that. Yeah. And that you know, I've happens. definitely died with a fog in my hand before. So I think most of us probably have. Yep. You just, you just think you're okay. And it turns out you're not. You're, you're not. Like, oh, why didn't I just sit <laughs> there on my fog and make sure I was okay? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Let's hear some parting thoughts here from Rachel um, about the game. And uh, yeah, just her thoughts on it. I, I had so much fun playing on game nights, uh, learning how new cards interact and finding out which new cards surprise you. Um, it, it's one of my favorite things about Commander is, is making all these new cards work with old cards. Uh, and I was just, I was blown away by so many of the new cards. It was a great moment for um, Mystic Reflection. And obviously I was blown away by how powerful uh, Coma was, especially in multiples. Um, Jimmy had me brewing my own Magda deck in my head the whole uh, episode. And Jorn uh, is apparently pronounced your. So we're learning a little bit of about uh, folklore as well, I guess. Uh, no, I'm, I'm, I'm kidding. Josh's deck was the only reason that we survived as long as we did. I wish uh, I had drawn some of my interaction so I, I could have helped him out. But alas, uh, the cards uh, were not kind to me that game. <laughs> <laughs> well, she loved your Magda deck. Yep. I loved it too, and I'm, I'm I'm glad that people are building it. I think I can't wait to retool it a little bit for more of a casual setting and sort of do that thing I said where I could slot in different dragons each time. I think that's going to be a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah. I loved your deck too, so it's cool. Make sure that you follow Rachel Weeks on Twitter at Rachel Reeks, and then she has a commander podcast called The Command Sphere, and uh, you can follow them on Twitter. You can find them on like iTunes and mm -hmm. all your, uh, your podcast apps. We're going to put uh, the Twitters and everything in the show description, so if you want to find those links, look there. And huge, huge love for Jacob. Um, he came on the show and had an immediate effect. Uh, we had such a great time having him on, too. You could just feel like he, you know, was already a part of the friend group almost, which is awesome. So uh, make sure you follow him on Twitter and Instagram. Not that he needs it. He's got a big following. <laughs> he has, like, over a million Instagram <laughs> yeah, followers. Yeah, you can find him on Twitter and Instagram under two different names. We'll show those all on the screen right now. Yep, and they will also be in the show notes so that if you want to Go down there, find him in the links. Mm -hmm. Tell him what a great job he was. Also, you should tell him that you want him to come back on to game nights. Um, in fact, we asked uh, Jacob, you know, if he wants to come back on the show and, and maybe, you know, maybe bring some other Cobra Kai cast members Ooh. with him. So let's see uh, what he said about that. I would love to be on another game nights. I, I mean, I, I've been a fan of the show for pretty much right when I got into Commander, like, probably a year ago is when I really got into Commander and I just watched all of the episodes in like a week or two. Um, I would love to, especially, I know Sholo uh, who plays Miguel, he's dying to get on. He's a big fan too. Uh, yeah, if 
we would totally be down to come on and you know hopefully uh, take that dub for Cobra Kai. Woo-hoo. Cobra Kai versus Command Zone. It That's just what has, I'm talking about. Let's we, go. We, we could do like the title card thing, you know, yeah. where you like, throw them together. They're going to kick our asses. Uh, <laughs> if we actually fight. In Magic, we have a chance. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, 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 yeah but yeah. they like train and stuff. If you were like right off Mulan, maybe you'd maybe, have a chance. Maybe, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I could, not I, me. I'm I could, old. Maybe I'll try and out-act them because I don't want to fight nobody, <laughs> especially after what I saw in I'll Cobra Kai and on them. the table. Yeah. It's just like you guys going... <laughs> Who's more? Yeah, and they're like, okay, I'm intimidated. That you win, you win. Yeah, Cobra Kai versus Command Zone. Let's make it happen. Uh, hey, anyone you want to bring on? You know, we are more than for it. So please, please, let's let's go. Yeah, it would be pretty cool to get Shola on the show. So yep. hopefully we can do that. Um, before we go, Jimmy, you mentioned this earlier, but I just wanted to tell everybody about a new spinoff idea we had yep. for a show called Coma Kai. Let's do it. Yeah. Coming very soon to Nixflix. Yeah, Nixflix, by the way, they're, they're really improving their yeah. slate of programming these they days. They got some, you know, really, really, they got a high budget movie called Snow Covered Mountain. Yeah, that looks really, yeah. really, really interesting. It looks intense. Yeah. <laughs> Talk <laughs> about acting. <laughs> Hey, it's pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> Josh took improv. He, he knows how to do it. Uh, oh, and finally, a lot of praise we must always heap on the editors that have you know worked really tirelessly and pay attention to every single detail to make sure that the product that you see on your screen is as high quality as it is. Yeah, Jake Boss. You can find him on Twitter at Jake Boss MTG. Josh Murphy. He's on Twitter at also named Josh. And this was the first episode where Manson really officially joined the Game Nights team as an editor and helped out a ton. Uh, Manson Lung. Uh, you can find him on Twitter at Boo. Bufeeg, B-U-F-E-E-G. You know all these people from Extra Turns. You should probably be following them anyway because they're just on our content all the time. Yep. Uh, And of course, you know, Look, you might want to build a deck from Kaldheim. You might want to get this sweet alternate art Voring Collect. Oh, that... Like, this is by far the coolest... Hold up high. This is one of the coolest cards I've ever seen in my entire life. I'm not going to lie. That like, art, this art is sweet. That art is just sweet. so yeah. sweet. And if you're going to do that, you can support the show as well by going to cardkingdom.com slash command zone. Get the cards you already were going to buy. But this time around, you're getting one from one of the, one of the best retailers in the world. They're going to send it to you so quickly. It's going to be in great condition. And you're supporting our content while you're doing it. Yeah, get your Magda, your Coma... Your Yorn. See, Yorn! I can say it right. <laughs> uh, make sure you put them into Ultra Pro sleeves. Protect everything. Put it into Ultra Pro deck boxes. Yeah. Buy those Ultra Pro playmats. And the final way to support all of our content, if you want to do things like watch game nights before everybody else, you could be having these discussions with Jimmy and I on our Discord because mm-hmm. uh, we're on there every single day. You get to watch extra turns early. If you go to patreon.com slash command zone, that's how you can contribute to our content directly. There's a lot of cool perks. Like we said, talking with us on our Discord, early access. There's free merchandise at certain tiers. So yeah. again, patreon.com slash command zone. All right, everyone. Thanks so much for watching another amazing episode of Game Nights. I know you're all excited for the next, as are we. Yeah, the next one is Time Spiral Remastered. We just shot it a couple days ago. It has one of your very favorite guests from the show returning. So uh, I'm not going to spoil who it is, though. That's all you got. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. (laughs) Maybe you can guess in the comments, everyone. All right. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time. Peace. For further inquiries, send an email to commandcast at rocketjump.com or ask us on Twitter at JF Wong and at Josh Lee Kwai. See you later, alligator. Greetings, humans. <laughs> <laughs>